Hey everybody, welcome to Monster Monday pre-show. Have a little stream beats going on here. Having a little water. I uh, want to let you know, as always, the music that you hear before the stream is from stream beats. Music by streamers for streamers. You will never get a copyright strike on your music for your YouTube videos or live streams or your Twitch streams when you use Streambeats over at Streambeats.com. Also want to talk about Mo over at the Tabletop Bellhop. Mo is the OG when it comes to all things tabletop games. He has all kinds of information. Uh, industry news, reviews, upcoming games, uh, and then just a whole galaxy of people that do all kinds of media, uh, whether it's podcasts, live streams, YouTube videos, whatever, related to the topic of any kind of tabletop games, party games, board games, card games, tabletop RPGs, you name it, you'll find it over at Mo, the Tabletop Bellhop. TabletopBellhop.com Hey, welcome viewers. Thanks for dropping by. Amish, good to see you. Hope your Monday is going well. Tonight we're going to look at the history of the mummy. So, think about any questions you might have on mummies as we're going through. Ladies and gentlemen, 
as always, the music that you are hearing behind my voice is music of Stream Beats. And you can find Stream Beats over at www.streambeats.com. It is copyright free music made by streamers for streamers. You won't get any copyright strikes if you use Stream Beats as the soundtrack in your YouTube videos, your live streams, or your streams over on Twitch or on other platforms. Also want to give a big shout out over to Mo at the Tabletop Bellhop. Mo is the OG when it comes to all things tabletop games, party games, board games, tabletop RPGs, classics, modern games, building games, you name it. If it can be played on a tabletop, Mo has information about it. Industry news, product reviews, previews of new games, deep dives on classic games, and he also has an entire galaxy of content creators that are making all sorts of podcasts, live streams, videos, and other types of content for tabletop games. So go check them out over at tabletopbellhop.com. All right, I'm going to go ahead and bring the music down here and get us switched over. All right, hey, welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Monster Monday. My name is DM Galabond, and tonight on Monster Monday 4... Monday, the 12th of July, 2021, we are going to be talking about a classic. Such a classic that not only has it appeared in every edition of D&D, but it's also had a lot of big Hollywood blockbuster movies going all the way back to the days of silent film made about it. Yes, that's right. We are talking about The Mummy. Ooh. And the mummy is one of those classic undead monsters that has been around in more or less an unchanged form. Uh, sometimes it gets a little tougher, sometimes it gets a little weaker. But the really cool thing as you go through the editions is all the ways that D&D has riffed off of the idea of the mummy. And we're going to look at that too. And that'll give us some inspiration when we start talking about how you can reskin the monster and use it in your own campaign. All right. So when we look at the mummy... As always, we look at the description of the mummy from the earliest editions of the game to the latest. And this image right here is the image of the mummy out of the second edition monstrous manual. So from basic D&D, we learned that mummies are undead monsters, the carefully prepared and bandaged swathed remains of long dead nobles and guardians who lurk near deserted ruins and tombs. From 1st edition, we learn that mummies are undead humans with existence on both the normal and the positive material planes. Now that's interesting. And I believe, I believe that's the only time they ever mention mummies having an existence on the positive material plane. Which means it's a rare thing, but it's a thing you can use. All right, and then finally, uh, from 2nd edition, mummies are corpses native to dry desert areas where the dead are entombed by a process known as mummification. Okay. All right, and uh, that's, almost like, that's almost like saying that water is a liquid that's made by turning it into a liquid. Okay, I, I'm not sure I'm really thrilled with that second edition description of the mummy, but oh well, it's D&D. &D. Now, what we're looking at here is we're looking at a picture of the mummy from D&D uh, &D Beyond, which is 5th edition D&D. &D. And we're going to talk about the lore of the mummy from the current edition, 5th edition, working backwards. So... One of the piece of lore they give us in 5th edition is called the Punished. Once deceased, an individual has no say in whether or not its body is made into a mummy. 
Some mummies were powerful individuals who displeased a high priest or pharaoh, or who committed crimes of treason, adultery, or murder. As punishment, they were cursed with eternal undeath, embalmed, mummified, and sealed away. Other times, mummies acting as tomb guardians are created from slaves that were put to death specifically to serve a greater purpose. So now, that's really cool lore that you can think about when you're trying to think, hmm, where would a mummy be good in my campaign? And thinking about these types of things and just sort of, okay, what part of your game... Uh, arena or a game world would be good to have a mummy with that kind of lore. From 4th edition, we learned that mummy guardians are created to protect important tombs against robbers. A mummy guardian either wanders its tomb, attacking all who enter, or it lies in its sarcophagus, rising to attack when the sarcophagus is opened. And then from 3rd edition, we learn... Mummies attack intruders without pause or mercy. They never attempt to communicate with their enemies and never retreat. An encounter with a mummy can end only with the destruction of one combatant or the other, unless the mummy's foe elects to retreat. All right, so that means they are relentless, and they are not going to stop coming after you if you do not, if you leave them undestroyed and you hang around all right creature type of the mummy is undead this is probably pretty obvious uh undead are once living creatures brought into a horrifying state of undeath through the practice of necro necromantic magic or some unholy curse undead include walking corpses such as vampires and zombies in parentheses and mummies as well as bodiless spirits such as ghosts and specters uh, so now, also, uh, walking corpses, you would also have to include skeletal undead, like skeletons or things like that. Stuff that doesn't necessarily have any flesh or any kind of covering like the mummy does on it. All right, now, now we're going to get into looking at uh, the mummy in more detail from the various editions of the game. All right, so going all the way back to basic D&D, looking into the rules cyclopedia, a mummy is armor class 3, which means it's pretty tough to hit. It has 5 plus 1 hit dice, and those little asterisks, that just means it has extra, extra abilities that it can do, which make it slightly tougher than a normal monster of that hit dice. Uh, movement feet is 60 feet per round out of combat or 20 feet per round in combat. Uh, the attack of the mummy is one touch. Um, touch, punch, whatever. Damage 1d12 plus disease. Saves as fighter 5. Morale is 12. Back in this edition, you rolled 2d6 to check the morale and anything that matched or was below its morale meant that it kept fighting so with a 12 morale it's always going to keep fighting there's no chance that this thing is going to back off intelligence of six so unlike some things unlike zombies mummies do have some modicum of intelligence and uh, they have a purpose sure and they are relentless in what they do, sure, but they're not just going to simply shamble towards the closest thing and try to eat it the way a zombie will. It's going to have a little bit of thought. Okay. Uh, mummies are undead monsters, carefully propelled, blah, blah, blah. We already talked about that. Um, mummies are often created as guardians for tombs, charged with the task of killing anyone who breaks into the tomb even if they must follow the trespassers to the very ends of the earth. Well, now, certainly that is that is in the spirit of the latter day, like within the last 10 or 20 years, the um, mummy films that have been box office hits where, you know, they go in and they disturb the mummy in the tomb and then it just chases them all over creation. 
All right. Uh, every character seeing a mummy must make a saving throw versus paralysis or stop, paralyzed with fear until the mummy is out of sight. The touch of a mummy causes disease in addition to damage, and there is no saving throw. This hideous, rotting affliction prevents all magical healing, slows normal healing to 10% of the normal rate. And the disease lasts until magically cured. Now, just to give you an idea of how punitive it is in this edition of the game, if you got a normal night's rest in this edition of the game, you would recover one hit point. So just think about recovering it at 10% of the normal rate. You would have to rest 10 nights before you would regain one hit point. So you can see how in this edition of the game, mummies were nothing to mess around with, especially for low-level parties. They were very, very tough. Unless mummies can damage only by spells, fire, or magical weapons, all of which do only half damage. So you burn it, and you still only do half damage to it. And they're immune to sleep, charm, and hold spells. Well, that's pretty much, uh, by 5th edition, we're used to the fact that undead cannot be uh, affected by things that charm or affect the mind. All right, so now we go to 1st edition. And a mummy still has an armor class of 3. It has... Um, and it still moves at 60 feet for a whole round or 20 feet in combat. 6 plus 3 hit dice, so it's gone up a little bit in hit dice. And uh, damage per attack is 1d12 and fear. So, again, uh, the blow from a mummy's arm smashes opponents for 1d12 points of damage and the scabrous touch of a mummy inflicts a rotting disease on any hit the disease will be fatal in one to six months and each month it progresses the diseased creature loses two points of charisma permanently it can be cured only by a magic spell cure disease the disease negates all cure wound spells infected creatures heal wounds at 10 percent the normal rate and the mere sight of a mummy within 60 feet will cause such fear and revulsion that unless a saving throw versus magic is successful, the victim will be paralyzed with fright for 1d4 melee rounds. And um, so if you have uh, a large party, you actually get a bonus against this. All right, they can only be harmed by magical weapons, even those do only one half normal damage, dropping all fractions. Uh, so in other words, 5 becomes 2, 3 becomes 1, etc, etc, etc. Okay, any creature killed by a mummy rots and cannot be raised from death until or unless a cure disease and raise dead spell are used within 6 turns. Once again, in this edition of the game, a turn is a 10 minute time period. So you have to you have to use cure disease and raise dead within an hour or else you ain't getting that character sheet back. That character sheet is just gone. Get out your dice and roll up a new one. Here's a flat. Here's a fresh sheet for you. Don't hate me. Uh, okay. So then here's where we get one of our first riffs in first edition. We get a curious creature out of the fiend folio called an adherer. And the Adherer is a really weird creature that was around for a few editions and then just disappeared. But I'm showing it to you because you might want to revive it in your own game. All right, so it's an armor class 3, 4 hit dice. It's a little bit faster than a normal uh, mummy. And it has one attack. It deals 1d3 damage, and it has adhesion as a special attack. So this curious creature bears a close resemblance to a mummy, man-sized, and with loose folds of dirty white skin, which appear on first sight to be a mummy's bandages. And it's just as vulnerable to fire as a mummy due to resinous solvent in its bodily fluids. Uh, it's immune to all first-level magic user spells except magic missile, which cause... 3d6 points of damage per missile. Wow. Okay. So that's a hell of a vulnerability there. 
Uh, creature skin constantly exudes a sour-smelling glue-like substance with very powerful adhesion properties. Any material except stone will adhere to it, and only fire, boiling water, or the creature's own voluntary secretions will break the adhesion. Thus, any weapon which hits the beast will adhere to it and only deliver half damage. Similarly, the creature will stick to any character it hits with its two-handed flailing fist attack. Uh, and its favorite tactic is to bind up an opponent in this fashion and use him as an involuntary shield. Ooh. Uh, the adhesion properties of the secretion wear off in 5 to 10 turns after the beast is killed. So 50 to 100 minutes after uh, the death of the creature. Uh, usually a hero will catch its prey by waiting in ambush, camouflaging itself by rolling in dirt, sticks, and leaves, and then artfully arranging larger pieces of, disease, of debris to conceal its form. Any prey passing near its hideout will trigger its attack response, and the adherer will pounce on the closest target, attempting to hit and cling to it with bulldog-like tenacity until the prey expires. So boiling water or boiling liquid of other types will cause the adherer 1, three, one to 3 points of damage if a sizable quantity is thrown over the beast. And the contents of a large bucket would just about suffice. And the adherer's taste for prey is wide-ranging, and it will usually attack given suitable opportunity. The only exception to this is the spider. The adherer will never attack a spider of whatever variety and sometimes has been known to cooperate with them in trapping prey. Okay, that's kind of interesting because we're going to see another variation coming up in a few editions of the game. All right, so we've already seen this lovely fellow before. This is the mummy from second edition. Uh... We've talked a little bit about their. We've talked a little bit about their uh, uh, description, and the one thing that we didn't mention is their height. They're usually, but not always, closed in rotting strips of linen, and they stand between five and seven feet tall and are supernaturally strong. So they're horrific enemies. A single blow inflicts 1d12 points of damage, and a touch, blah 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 blah. All of the same, all of the same stuff that we learned in first edition. Now let's just make sure this. They still are um, armor class three, have a movement of six, uh, six plus three hit dice, and have a thaco of 13 or a thaco of 13 to hit armor class zero and one attack for 1d12, and they inflict fear and disease. Okay, so, uh, mummies are the product of an embalming process used on wealthy and important persons. Most mummies are corpses without magical properties. On occasion, perhaps due to powerful evil magic, or sometimes the individual is so greedy in life he refuses to give up his treasure. The spirit of the mummified person will not die, but trap taps into energy from the positive material plane and is transformed into an undead horror. Most mummies retain, uh, remain dormant until their treasure is taken, but they become aroused and kill without mercy. A uh, mummy lives in its ancient burial chamber, usually at the heart of a crypt or pyramid. Uh, and, and it talks a little bit about that and the ecology. To create a mummy, a corpse should be soaked in preserving fluid. Uh, typically carbonate of soda for several weeks and covered with spices and resins. Body organs such as heart, brain, liver are typically, typically removed and sealed in jars. Sometimes gems are wrapped in the cloth. Uh, mummies are not part of the natural ecosystem and have no natural enemies. And mummy dust is a component for rotting and disease magical items. So, uh, a greater mummy is a, another version of this. Now, this one has an armor class of 2, uh, movement of 9, and hit dice of 8 plus 3, and its uh, damage per attack is 3d6. So, also known as An Anktipat's children, greater mummies are a powerful form of undead creator when high-level lawful evil priest of certain religions is mummified and charged with guarding of a burial place. It can survive for centuries as a steadfast protector of its lair, killing all who would defile its holy resting place. And they look um, just like more common cousins, except they're almost always adorned with unholy symbols and wear the vestments of their religious order. 
They're keenly intelligent and are able to communicate just as they did in life. They have the inherent ability to telepathically command all normal mummies created by them. So just imagine the greater mummy guarding its tomb and everyone that succumbs to its attacks gets turned into a regular mummy that it commands. Those can be the appetizers until you work your way deep in the tomb where you find the greater mummy. Hmm. Okay, greater mummies radiate an aura of, aura of fear that causes all creatures who see them to make a fear check. And they have the option of attacking with their own physical powers or the great magic granted to them by the gods they served in life. They may strike out once per round, inflicting 3d6 points of damage per attack. And they get the rotting disease and yada yada. Um, now, remember the in earlier editions it said that this rotting disease would drain uh, two points of constitution every so often. But um, in this edition... The older the mummy, the faster the disease manifests itself. Causes the person to die within a short time or less prodigal, proper medical care can be obtained. 24 hours after infecting the blow, after the infecting blow lands, the character loses one point of strength and constitution. Further, they lose two points of charisma as their skin begins to flake and wither like old parchment. Uh, only one form of magical healing has any effect. Regenerate will cure the disease and restore lost hit points, but not ability scores. All their healing spells are wasted. Okay, and um, a series of cure disease spells, one for each day it's passed since the rotting was contracted, will temporarily halt the infection until a complete cure can be effected. And regaining lost ability scores is not possible through any means short of a wish. Okay, so now that was that was super hard to overcome a greater mummy's attack in this edition of the game. And um, the body of someone who dies from mummy rot starts to crumble as soon as death occurs. And greater mummies can be turned by those who have the courage and conviction to attempt this feat. However, the older the mummy, the harder it is to overcome in this fashion. And then, perhaps the most horrible aspect of these creatures is their spellcasting ability. Uh, all greater mummies uh, were priests in their past lives and now retain the spellcasting abilities they had. They will cast spells as if they were at 16th through 20th level. And they have the same spheres available to them that they did in life. Uh, so, now... Uh, Notice we have tables for the greater mummy of how much tougher and uh, how much more, you know, how much more of a pain they are to fight. So they gain, if they've been dead 99 years or less, they have the AC2 and 8 plus 3 hit dice. If they've been dead 500 or more years, they have a plus 4 to hit. Armor class of negative 3, 13 plus 3 hit dice, and a Thacko of 7. So, a lot more hit points, a lot harder to hit, and it's a lot easier for them to hit you. And then, notice their wisdom increases the longer they've been dead. They've been dead 500 or more years, they have a wisdom of 23. And um, the uh, 25... Or the magic is natural magic resistance. So 25% magic resistant. That means that any spell you cast at it, you have to roll a d100. And there's a 25% chance that it doesn't even need to make a saving throw. The spell just fizzles and doesn't work. Uh, and then the level of the caster at 500 or more years is 20th level caster. Uh, your your check to save against its fear is made with a minus four and it has seven d4 mummies that it has created that will be its followers and its kind of its henchmen all right so that is 
that's a pretty tough thing for the greater mummy and you'll see how the greater mummy has morphed over the editions and become something similar but slightly different uh, but i think it's always nice to know where they came from and you can talk about you know sort of how you want to do that hey guess what in second edition we have our old friend the adherer and the adherer once again very similar to what it was in um what it was in first edition and um now, an interesting thing they introduced in the Monster Tomes in 2nd Edition is they introduced ecology. Uh, so it says, Adherers do not breed like mammals or reptiles. Sages have suggested that the Adherer simply splits into two creatures if there's enough prey in the area to support more than one. And the normal lifespan of an Adherer is 35 years. Uh, all attempts to use the Adherer's bodily secretions to make potions, adhesives, or any other item have failed. The fluid loses its potency within 12 hours of the creature's death, and no magical or mundane means has been found to prevent or even slow this deterioration. You know, you put that in a monster tome, and you're just going to encourage every player at the table to go, Well, what if we tried this? <laughs> and if your DM is that kind of DM that likes the rule of cool, they're just going to wait until they until you come up with a really clever and really cool idea and they might go yeah try that and i'll even give it a chance of working all right uh so that's second edition now we come to third edition and this is the mummy in third edition looks like a withered and desiccated corpse with features hidden beneath centuries old funeral wrappings moves with slow shambling gait and groans with the weight of ages um, so some of their abilities they inspire despair the mere sight of a mummy it's a dc 16 will save or be paralyzed with fear and mummy rot a dc 16 fortitude save incubation one minute Damage 1d6, Constitution, and 1d6, Charisma. Uh, Mummy Rat continues until the victim reaches Constitution 0 and dies or is cured. And then, remember our friend the Greater Mummy? Well, now in 3rd edition, he has become the Mummy Lord. And um, so what's interesting is notice that in the hit points, the hit dice remain the same so for a normal mummy it's 8d12 plus 3 or 55 hit points mummy lord is 8d12 plus 10d8 for 97 hit points and um, the speed is um, 20 feet and uh, for the normal mummy or 15 feet in half plate armor and uh, again, the uh, the base attack and grapple, and you know, is pretty much um, higher for the mummy lord. Greater damage, but still only one attack. Um, despair, mummy rot, and then uh, as its special, some of its special abilities, the mummy lord gets rebuke undead and spells. Um, and it has a bunch of uh, a bunch of different other feats and abilities. All right. Uh, so Mummy Rot's powerful curse to eliminate Mummy Rot, the curse must first be broken with break enchantment or remove curse, requiring a DC 20 caster level check for either spell. After which a caster level check is no longer necessary to cast healing spells on the victim. Mummy Rot can be magically cured as any normal disease. An afflicted creature who dies of mummy rot shrivels away into sand and dust that blow away with, uh, into nothing at the first wind. So the mummy lord uh, gets, uh, gets a range of spells prepared. And in 3rd edition, they started giving you sort of a suggested... Uh, a suggested palette of spells now it tells you how many spells they have but of course you are free as the DM to swap out any of those spells as long as you stick to the number 
So six cantrips, seven first level, six second level, five third level, five fourth level, and four fifth level spells. Uh, and then all kinds of um, lovely, lovely spells, you know, bull strength that can cast presumably on itself or one of its uh, undead minions, deeper darkness, invisibility purge, uh, spell immunity, insect plague, slay living, symbol of pain um all right so yeah it's a it's a pretty uh, this is the mummy lord with all of its uh, accoutrement and uh, special armor and everything and of course it uh it's pretty pretty interesting looking monster there all right, then in 4th edition, we have several different versions of the mummy, including one of my favorite variations that we will be talking about. All right, uh, you have a mummy guardian, which is the garden variety mummy from previous editions. And then you have the mummy lord, which is like the mummy lord or the greater mummy. And, you know, they're just about double the hit points not quite uh regeneration so they will regenerate uh damage every round unless they take radiant damage and then they have the rotting slam uh and the greater mummy gets this awe strike plague of doom the mummy's curse uh and unholy aid so the Mummy Lord automatically saves against the triggering effect. Uh, and then Second Wind spends a healing surge and regains 51 hit points. Gains a plus two bonus to all defenses until the start of its next turn. Okay, so uh, the uh, Mummy, or there's two flavors of Mummy Rot. The 8th level Mummy Rot from the Guardian and the 10th level Mummy Rot from the mummy lord actually there's three because we have a giant mummy we haven't seen yet uh so the this table here shows what happens if you save or you fail to save so the initial effect target regains only half normal number of hit points if you save once the target is cured if you fail to save, the target regains only half the number of hit points from healing effects. In addition, takes 10 necrotic damage, which cannot be healed until the target is cured of the disease. And then if you fail again, the target dies. And then the level 13 is pretty much the same. And what's changing here is the DC. Um, uh, the DC to improve, to maintain, or to worsen. And then um, the giant mummy, again, uh, has a DC 29 to improve, DC 24 to maintain, and DC 23 or lower will worsen it. And the giant mummy uh, is a mummy of a giant creature, uh, oddly enough. It is a level 21 monster. Uh, 240 hit points, regenerates, has the rotting slam, the dust of blinding death. At least a cloud of corrosive dust, close burst uh, for 1d8 plus 7 acid damage, and the target takes ongoing 10 acid damage and is blinded. And um, we will see how this dust of blinding death actually translated into 5th edition into the Mummy Lord. But before we leave 4th edition, there's a very interesting, interesting mummy-like creature I want to talk about. Because it's guaranteed to freak out some of your players. That is the uh, Tomb Spider uh, Brood Swarm. Okay. So... The Tomb Spider is a is a denizen of the Shadowfell that lives in tombs, and 
it is so named because it lays its eggs in a humanoid corpse, creating an animated mummy in which hundreds of tiny tomb spiders reside until the creature splits open. Tomb spiders are frequently employed by followers of Orcus, which delight in their normal ability to create undead as part of their reproductive cycle. So now, this, this just is my favorite thing to think about throwing at a party. It's just, oh, it's a mummy. It's a mummy, and you it comes at you, and it starts to fight you, and you... Um, you make one hack at it, and uh, okay, some of its uh, some of its wrappings start to come, and it seems to be some kind of weird movement inside those wrappings. Then you hit it again, and the entire thing just bursts, and all these little spiders just start crawling all over everybody. Ooh, ooh, just make the skin crawl of some of your players. A really, really, really fun type of thing to uh, throw at them. So um, the Brood Swarm is a level 10 Lurker. Uh, swarm attack, aura 1. Each enemy that starts its turn within the aura is slowed until the start of its next turn. Uh, AC of 24. Resist half damage from melee and range attacks. Um, and a speed of 5 or 25 feet. Um, and then 25 feet climb. Has dread... Dread Fangs, which uh, deliver necrotic and poison damage. Shadow Drift shifts five squares and gains a plus four bonus to all defenses. So it's kind of like a, almost kind of like a Misty Step, if you will, but or a Shadow Step effect in 5th uh, edition. And then the Tomb Spider Brood Swarm ignores the effects of spider webs and spider swarms. So that just is... Uh, that's just a thing that I think could be really cool to use in a party. I think this Tomb Spider Brood Swarm is my favorite riff on the mummy that they have come up in with in regular D&D. All right, so now in 5th edition, the mummy is, has an AC of 11, so it's not that hard to hit 58 hit points. Uh, it's vulnerable to fire damage. Now, you remember way back in the day, it said in early editions that fire did only half damage. Well, now in 5th edition, fire does double damage to it. Uh, damage resistances, it takes half damage from non-magical weapon attacks. Uh, it's immune to necrotic and poison damage, and also immune to the mind-affecting spells. Uh, and notice that it actually has languages, any language it knew in life. Um, and it doesn't say that it cannot speak. Uh, but in the description of it, it says it does not speak. It has the capability to speak, but it will not speak. So multi-attack. It uses dreadful glare and makes one attack with a rotting fist. So the rotting fist deals 3d6 uh, or 2d6 plus 3 bludgeoning damage and 3d6 necrotic damage. So now this is a CR3 monster. This is something you're going to throw at tier 1 players. And one connecting attack is going to do 5d6 plus 3 total damage. So that's pretty that's a that's a pretty hefty uh, amount of damage coming from a low level creature. Uh, target must succeed on a DC 12 or be cursed with mummy rot. And the target can't regain hit points. Hit points maximum decreases by 3d6 for every 24 hours that, that elapse. If the curse reduces the target's hit point maximum to zero, the target dies and, body, and the body turns to dust. The curse lasts until removed by remove curse spell or other magic. And you notice that it's a curse and not a disease. So that means that you get one saving throw at it. If you fail that saving throw... Your only hope is to get a remove curse because you don't get subsequent saving throws. So that is a, a really, really important uh, factor to keep in mind when you're 
thinking about using these uh, in against a low-level party. So Dreadful Glare uh, targets a creature can see within six, 60 feet, must succeed on a DC 11 wisdom save, or become frightened until the end of the mummy's next turn. And if the target fails a save by five or more, it's also paralyzed for the same duration. And uh, once you succeed, you're immune to Dreadful Glare of all mummies, but not mummy lords, for the next 24 hours. And then, you know, Preserved Wrath. So the, you know, it, um, the long burial rituals it help protect the body from rot. And after the body's been prepared, the corpse is typically wrapped in uh, linen bandages. Uh, Will of the Dark Gods is created when the priest of a death god or other dark deity ritually imbues a prepared corpse with necromantic magic. The mummy's linen wrappings are inscribed with necromatic markings before the burial ritual concludes with an invocation to darkness. And as the mummy endures an undeath, it animates in response to conditions specified by that ritual. And we already talked about the punished. And its creature of ritual, it obeys the conditions and parameters laid down by the rituals that created it. Are driven only to punish transgressors. So that's a, another thing to consider if you're using Mummy in a 5e game. What are the parameters? What exactly is this Mummy been tasked to do? Uh, does it guard a specific location and the only thing it cares about is keep, pe people, keeping people out? So therefore, it may not chase people that uh, flee. Uh, if it is to punish anyone who transgresses, then it may stay there until somebody transgresses, and then it may just keep pursuing them until it is destroyed. So, ending a mummy's curse, rare magic can undo or dispel the ritual that gave rise to a mummy, allowing the creature to truly die. And uh, more commonly, a mummy can be sent back to its endless rest by undoing the transgression that caused it to rise. Sacred idol might be replaced to its niche. Stolen treasure could be returned to its tomb, or a temple might be purified of despoiling bloodshed. More ephemeral or permanent offenses, such as revealing a secret the mummy wished kept, or killing an individual the mummy loved, can't be so easily remedied. And undead archives. Uh, though they seldom bother to do so, mummies can speak. As a result, some of them serve as undead repositors of lost lore and can be consulted by the descendants of those who created them. Powerful individuals sometimes intentionally sequester mummies away for occasional consultation. Okay, that's creepy. And then we have the mummy lord, which we don't have a picture of. Um, I guess because it kind of looks just like a mummy. Uh, tougher, more hit dice, harder armor class. Uh, stat block uh, magic resistance has advantage on saving throws rejuvenation um, destroyed mummy lord gains a new body in 24 hours if its heart is intact regaining all of its hit points and becoming active again new body appears in 5 feet of mummy lord's heart and then spell casting so it's got up to 6 level spells and it Deals the Rotting Fist and the Dreadful Glare. Uh, now, this Rotting Fist deals 3d6 plus 4 bludgeoning and 66 necrotic damage. So that's 9d6 plus 4 uh, that it deals whenever it punches you. So you're going to feel that in the morning if you get hit by that thing. And then it also gets legendary actions. And legendary actions are things that the Mummy Lord can do at the end of another creature's turn. So it can use that Blinding Dust. Remember we saw that in 4th edition. Uh, blinding Dust and Sand swirl magically around the Mummy Lord. Each creature must uh, succeed on a DC con save or be blinded. And then Blasphemous Word. He utters a blasphemous word. Each non-undead creature within 10 feet of the mummy can hear must succeed DC con save or be stunned. And then channel negative energy. Um, unleashes negative energy. Creatures within 60 feet, including one behind barriers and around corners, can't regain hit points until the end of the mummy lord's next turn. 
And then finally, Whirlwind of Sand, which is a teleportation effect, if you will. Uh, it's actually a movement effect. It's not teleportation, but it's a kind of cool movement. Mummy Lord magically transforms into a whirlwind of sand, moves up to 60 feet, and reverts to its normal form. While in whirlwind form, Mummy Lord is immune to all damage and can't be grappled, petrified, knocked prone, restrained, or stunned. Equipment worn or carried by the Mummy Lord remain in its possession. Uh, and then it gets lair actions, and there are regional effects of being near the lair. And then the heart of the Mummy Lord is kept in a jar. Now, I will tell you that in my Saturday... Uh, oh, well, we're going to talk about or my Sunday game. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So let's go back to the slides here. And we will talk about how you can use mummies in encounters. So uh, I always like to try to create a hard or challenging encounter with these creatures for a party of five PCs by level. Um, for a party of level one characters, a mummy is hard just beyond deadly well remember it does 5d6 points of damage so i'm not really sure i mean by the book it says that it would be just you know if you have experienced players they could probably take down a mummy but they would almost assuredly have to make sure that none of them got hit because 5d6 worth of damage against a level 1 character would knock them usually into next week. Um, maybe enough, depending on how how well the DM rolls on their damage, maybe enough to just outright kill a first level character with one shot. Uh, so level 2 party, it becomes a medium challenge and add one skeleton to make it a, a hard challenge. And then at a level three party, it's an easy challenge and add a second mummy to make it a hard challenge. So that is thinking about using them in encounters. Now, if you are a player and you are facing a mummy, avert your eyes. Glare of a mummy can not only frighten, but it can paralyze if, if you screw up on your saving throw. And when you're paralyzed, the character is unable to attack, defend, or do anything until the effect is broken. So if the mummy is near you and paralyzes you, oh, you're probably on the menu for getting a nice big punch before you can break out of that paralysis. Um, and then avoid hand-to-hand -hand combat. The attacks of the mummy can inflict mummy rot and magical disease, or actually curse, like we said, that deals necrotic damage every day. It means the character cannot heal lost hit points, and it makes mummies a very deadly low-level adversary. So, tactics for how you can use mummies as a DM. So, first of all, ask yourself, do you need a mummy or do you need a mummy lord? Um... Uh, they occupy very similar niches, but one is kind of a scary tier one monster, where the other one is scary probably at tier three. The Mummy Lord is probably scary at tier three. Um, and you could be that kind of DM and dress up a mummy to look fancy, ter uh, terrifying a little of a party to think that they're facing a Mummy Lord, or you could dress down a mummy lord against a higher level party and make it look very plain and unremarkable, giving the, the party the impression that, oh, it's just a run-of-the-mill mummy, until it starts casting spells. So mummy rot's a great curse to give a low-level PC that can open up doors to other adventures. Perhaps a local temple requires a service to cast the remove curse from the PC. Uh, something like that. You know, it, it's an adventure that can lead to other adventures. Uh, you can be led to other quest givers through through this. And um, if you use the lore for guidance, maybe the party will run across a mummy that was punished for a transgression in life, and they must release the creature's spirit by hunting down uh, and destroying it, or by uh, completing some task or setting right some wrong that the um, mummy was punished for. 
So that's kind of an interesting, you know, a few interesting ways you could use mummies as a DM. So now where would you place mummies in a campaign? So a uh, mummy is a good low-level monster straight out of mythology and pop culture. You can use to add a bit of creepiness into any low-level campaign. So tier one, and with as hard as they hit, they could easily be like your first boss monster. Like if your if your party is going and exploring some tomb because they've been sent there to recover like a magic item or something like that, then maybe, you know, as they've gone through the earlier levels of this tomb, they've found there's a theme, there's a fair number of undead around in this tomb, and then the final guardian that they have to face turns out to be a mummy, you know, when the party has finally reached level two or maybe level three. So that could be, uh, you know, that could make for a nice challenging fight when they get to that point. And then a mummy lord is a good challenge for a low to mid tier uh, three party. It's likely to be upper middle management boss in the evil Inc. organization of your campaign. Uh, the arc of your story takes you only up to tier two. Maybe the mummy lord is the final boss. And if it goes all the way to tier four, then maybe an arch lich is pulling the strings with a mummy lord in charge of some important division of the evil empire's operation. All right, now, reskinning the monster. Uh, there, notice we have a Magic Gathering card here, Scab Goliath. Uh, there's a reason for that. So the older versions of the game give us good ideas for using reskinning. You could look at the Adhere from 1st and 2nd edition. You could change the chance to contract Mummy Rot to a chance to be grappled or stuck to the creature. And the necrotic damage could become like acid damage that would be like the adherer's digestive juices trying to absorb whatever the creature whatever creature is stuck to it maybe you could say that the way the adherer feeds is that it just sort of uh, secretes acid digestive acid onto anything that's stuck to it and then just sort of sort of absorbs the nutrients through its skin you could also reskin a mummy like uh, as a swarm, like the Tomb Spider Brood Swarm from 4th edition. So change the attacks to a swarming mass of poisonous spiders or scarabs that crawl all over the victim, delivering painful and damaging bites. And as for the Mummy Lord, uh, I've already made another Monster Monday where I detailed how I used the core stat block of the Mummy Lord to create a Scab Goliath for my Planeswalking D&D and Magic the Gathering crossover game. That is my Sunday game, Walker of Waterdeep. And they faced that when they were in the plane of Innistrad. Um, in fact, there were two of them. Uh, they did have to do battle against one of them. Uh, there was another one that they saw, but they were able to find the jars holding the hearts of both monsters and destroyed those jars before they ever had to fight the second one so uh, they didn't have to go through uh, they didn't have to go through that but yeah that uh, though so the mummy lord with its uh, special movement abilities uh, its magical spell casting everything it was just it was just too good of a template for me to pass up not using for the Scab Goliath because they're, um, I mean, they're just supposed to be hideous, horrible, um, you know, abominations that uh, will really mess up your day. And I wanted to make it a super scary monster in that campaign. Okay. All right, so uh, we have a few folks in the in the chat tonight. Hey, Bobo, Doors of Fear. All right, so uh, Amish says, I think I saw a mummy this weekend on another D&D stream, probably. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, okay. Character would add a tongue to it and unwrap the mouth bandages for it to talk. Okay, <laughs> yeah, probably possibly. Uh, question. Are mummies just the aftermath of a curse, magical means to continue their station uh, of the life of the mummy before it was mummified? 
So in other words, a guard mummified would guard, a baker mummified would bake, or at least try to in the motions of said task. So baker mummy would use recipe or infiltrator and pummel them to put a baking recipe. <laughs> well, actually, um, there's an indication in several of the editions that the mummification process, uh, the priest that mummifies the corpse gives the instructions to the mummy so now i suppose i suppose if you considered that there was a powerful evil king that had himself and his entire court mummified he might indeed tell the priests yes kill and mummify my bakers because i want them to bake my bread and that might be their task and then they would attack anybody that dares to dares to put their finger in the bread and see if it is uh, ready yet. Oh, oh, don't you touch my sourdough. Don't you touch my sourdough, you fleshling. I'll give you some mummy rot. Well, then, of course, you'd give it the voice of Fred Sanford. Hey, come here, you big dummy. I'm going to get you. All right, uh, so, <laughs> all right, uh, all of the typical uh, puns, just need my mummy. Are you my mummy? Got to be someone's mummy. Uh, yeah, and then you could, of course, go ahead and, uh, in your game, say that a mummy might be good aligned or neutral aligned. You could just throw it completely on its head and have this be a a protector or guardian on the side of good um now undead you know typically they have some uh you know they typically are considered evil but they don't have to be uh you could swap out the necrotic damage for radiant damage if you're going to make them let's say some kind of mummy created by a uh, deity of good uh, with some sort of noble uh, purpose uh, to its existence. So yeah, that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out tonight. I hope you have enjoyed our look at the history of the mummy in D&D. And I hope that uh, you will um, that you will be back with us next week. Just want to remind everyone, I am DM Galabond, and I am streaming four days on most weeks. Sunday afternoons, you'll find me with the 5th edition Walker of Waterdeep, that planeswalking crossover game I was talking about. 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We stream that on YouTube and on Twitch. On Thursday nights at 8 p.m., you will find us at, with the Sword Coast Chronicles. That is our 5th edition game, and in that game, the party has just left the um, land of Barovia and is now on the castle of a cloud giant looking for a kidnapped storm giant. Hmm. So, wonder, what storyline from 5th edition are they in now? Uh, then, 2nd edition, Saturday Night Greyhawk, the, the party is all but finished clearing out the old moat house, which has been promised to them by the city fathers of Hamlet. Uh, they have promised to give them the deed to that so that they can turn it into their own stronghold. But um, they have noticed that there are some evil cultists led by a guy who was able to get away with just a few hit points left because he cast continual darkness uh, and obscured the entire battlefield. And he was able to run away. And he was the leader of this uh, cult. So 
they brought some of the symbols of office and some of the cloaks back to town and now they want to talk to the clerics and to some of the city fathers and see if they know anything about that um, they're probably going to find out some interesting information about that uh, when we have our next session on saturday night all right, and you can find me on all the usual places, uh, Twitch over at twitch.tv, Galabond, uh, YouTube, you can look for me, YouTube, Galabond, or just click the link. And then we do have a Patreon uh, where if you want to try to help us uh, create more content, it'd be great to see uh, some folks over there at the Patreon. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, hope you have enjoyed tonight's show. And I will sign off, as I always do, by reminding you to watch out for the monsters under the bed. We're going to bring up the music, and we will say good night, everybody.